Today, my job is to take the book of Romans, all 16 chapters, and prepare you to, to, I'm gonna give you an overview of the entire book, almost like this is a gigantic Bible class. By the end of this session, you will know Romans, you'll know what's in it, and you'll be ready to study it for the rest of your life. Everybody got that? Now, first question is, you gotta ask, why was it written? Our title for this is this, Clear Thinking in Confused Times, okay? Now, look up here, Clear Thinking. A great life is wired like this. If you make great decisions, you will have fewer regrets. Isn't that what everybody wants? I want to make great decisions and have fewer regrets because bad decisions lead to nothing but regret. I'll give you an example, okay? In 1936, two guys sold the rights to Superman forever for $65. Bad decision. A thief in Boston attempted to steal two live Maine lobsters by sticking them down the front of his pants. <laughs> really bad decision. A South African hang gliding instructor saw a beautiful woman sunbathing on the roof below his flight pattern. He decided to make an obscene gesture for her. Her husband appeared with a submachine gun and blasted him out of the air. Bad decision. Okay. Here's a, three prison guards were fired for giving prisoners a trampoline during an exercise break because they were jumping over a fence and escaped. Bad decision. And somebody gave me one last night, Magic Johnson. Remember Magic Johnson? Okay. Magic Johnson had a choice to make. I can go with Converse or I can go with Nike. He went with Converse. Converse offered him $100,000. Nike offered him stock. He went with $100,000 and turned down what today would be $5.2 billion in Nike stock for $100,000 from Converse. Really bad decision. Now, why is that a big deal? Look up here, okay, look up here. The decisions that you make, teenagers, everybody else, the decisions that you make determine the direction that you take. Decisions determine direction, and direction determines destiny. In other words, every single thing about how you turn out is wired by the decision. But this is good news. Your future is not determined by your past. Your future is not determined by a dysfunctional family. Your future is not determined by the economy. It is not determined by the governor. It is not determined. Your future is totally wired by the decision you make. And the goal of the book of Romans is that you would make great God-honoring decisions and have a life with, re with no regrets and a lot of gratitude. Everybody got that? Okay, that's the book of Romans, and one person's very fired up about this. Great. Now, uh, grab your notes, and I'm going to get ripping on this thing. You ready? Here we go. Number one is this. The, um, we are beginning a 16-week study on the single greatest letter. I've given you a whole bunch of quotes there. I only want to highlight one, okay? Rick Warren said this. You can't say enough about this book. It's the basic handbook for Christianity. Romans has influenced millions of people. It's changed history. Martin Luther started the Reformation because of the Book of Romans. John Wesley started the Wesleyan revivals. Augustine became a Christian because of the Book of Romans. All throughout history, God has used the Book of Romans to influence people's lives. It is impossible to overstate the influence of this one letter. All throughout history, God has used Romans to set people free, to fuel people for their future, and to do miracles in people's lives, and... Now it's your turn. It's your turn. Y'all ready? Good. Let's get at it. Quick facts about Romans. Number one, Rome, the book of Romans was written to people living in Rome. Very good. Why is that a big deal? It was the world's only superpower. So it was written to a major, major place to make a major impact. Now, the other thing is this, and I'm going to ask you a quick question. Has anybody here ever, like, if you had the opportunity to safely time travel, Back in history, who would take it? Who would go? Yeah, as long as you got to come back, who would take it? Some of you going, I don't want to come back. Um, the, where would you go? Tell the person next to you. You only got 15 seconds, ready? Where would you go? Time travel back, where would you go? All right, where are you going? 
Okay, now, the reason I asked you that question, okay, come on back, here we go, back to time travel here. Good job. The reason I asked you that question is this. Um, that's a setup. If I asked you the question, who wrote the book of Romans? No, okay? What happened is this. Paul is living in, we'll come back to that in a second. Paul is living in Corinth. He wants to get to Rome, to influence Rome and all of the people under tremendous pressure in California, I mean Rome. And he wants to, he wants to influence these people and strengthen these people. And he keeps trying to get to Rome. He can't get to Rome. So he hires a guy to write the book named Tertius. And Paul does a lecture and says, write everything down. And he dictates, this is awesome, he dictates the whole book of Romans to a writer. Romans 16, 22, this guy who's writing it says, hi, I, Tertius, wrote this with my own hand. Kind of bragging about himself. The, um, and so what happens is this, Paul dictates this. People, this is Paul speaking. I would love, there are certain, I love hearing great preaching, don't you? Okay, uh, the, I love attempting it, but I really like hearing it, okay? And, and the, our Bible conference, I was here Monday, or it was Sunday night, Francis Chan spoke, Monday night, Bishop Kenneth Ulmer spoke, Tuesday, and then I had to fly Tuesday morning to Seattle to speak at a pastor's conference, which means I'm missing part of the Bible conference. Mark Clark was on Tuesday night. So I got all this stuff I got to do up there on Tuesday night, but I thought, okay, look, I only have a few minutes here. I'm going to watch the first five minutes of Mark's message at the Bible conference and see how he's doing, and then I got to get some other stuff done. I watch... Five minutes, I couldn't stop watching. I watched the whole stupid thing. <laughs> I could not stop watching. Some communicators are so compelling. You're like, I want to be there. I want to be sitting there. I want to bring people. And I can't stop watching. This is so good. Imagine the next 16 weeks. Because Paul dictated this. He spoke this. And some, the, like the book of Romans is your chance to time travel and hear the Apostle Paul lecture. It's the closest thing you will ever get to hearing somebody lecture. This is awesome, okay? Now, everybody got that? Other quick facts about this book are, are this. They're on the outline there. You can, you can get all of that kind of stuff down. It, is, it contains the greatest examination of all the theological truths. The They're all packed in one book, okay? And if you're going, and then the other thing is this. Paul greets 26 people by name. A lot of pastors like crowds. They just don't like people. That wasn't the Apostle Paul. Okay? And the key verse is Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. This is the theme of the book of Romans. Justification by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's get at it. Go to the back of your page for a second. And I want to orient you to the entire book. Okay, everybody got that? Here we go. Back of the page, Romans is in three massive sections. The first, he's, he says 17 verses saying hi. Then he dives in and ver, chapters one through eight are doctrine. That's what we believe, okay? Then chapters nine through 11 are Israel and the gospel, the purpose, problem, and persistence of God and the gospel with the nation of Israel. And then chapter 12, he puts it in high gear and he says, how do you live the gospel with God, with other people, with society, and in the church? The first two-thirds of the book of Romans is what we believe. The last section of the book is, is how we should behave. Do you know any Christians that believe they just don't behave very well? You know anybody like that? The book of Romans was written to correct both these things and to stabilize you and if you go to the inside, go to the inside of this, here's what's really going on. Romans is going after the four biggest issues of life. Paul is writing this, so you will make great God-honoring decisions and have way fewer regrets. And so he covers the four biggest issues in life. And here they are, our greatest problem, our greatest challenge, our greatest calling, and our greatest fear. And he starts with, what is your greatest problem? What is my greatest problem? Here it is. Our greatest problem? Here it is. It's sin. Sin, uh, sin literally devastates. Sin fascinates, then assassinates. And he starts in Romans 3.23 with these phrases. He says, for all, circle the word all. By the way, in the Greek, all means all. He says, for all have sinned. Turn to the person next to you and say, that means you. 
And if you're a husband and you said to your wife, that was an idiot test you flunked. The, uh, he says this, for, I love this verse though. He goes, for all, Kurt, Andrew, Mark, Billy Graham, whoever, for all fall, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, what's the problem with that? Sin automatically leads to devastation, but it automatically leads on the inside to emotional guilt, okay? And guilt is the number one destroyer of happiness. Guilt is the number one source of most people's stress. Guilt can cause physical illness, emotional illness. Guilt is the number one cause of most people's depression. Guilt is a heavy thing to carry around. It saps you of energy. Matter of fact, when guilt exits, when guilt enters your life, joy exits. You cannot be guilty, you cannot feel guilt and joy at the same time. When guilt enters your life, hope exits. When guilt enters your life, energy exits, okay? Guilt, here's the deal. Guilt makes you an emotional disaster, okay? Now, what's God's prescription to free you from getting out of a locked prison of your past? Here it is. It's grace. It's grace. I love this verse. We are all justified freely by his grace through the redemption, circle the word redemption, that's a heavyweight theological word we'll be coming back to, through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. You and I are justified, but it says we're justified freely. Now, if, so which means this, I've got a choice. I all have sinned, which means I'm gonna spend my entire life saturated with guilt or liberated by grace. Why does this matter so much? Because most Christians these days, most of us in this audience, we have a disease called grace deficiency. And when you have this, here's what happens. I'm gonna put this up on the screen, okay? Lack, fear and guilt are lack of grace turned upward toward God. Criticism and judgmentalism, and how many of you know people like that? <laughs> yeah, evidently. Criticism and judgmentalism, that's lack of grace turned outward at other people, and that's an epidemic right now. And then perfectionism and depression is lack of grace turned inward, which means if I have a grace deficiency, I have a, I'm literally, I'm gonna be a mess up with God. I'm gonna be a mess and destroy relationships with other people. And uh, inward side, I'm gonna be depressed, locked in a prison of my past with no escape out. Let me ask, I'm gonna get real serious here and ask you a point blank question. Here it is. What is it that you have never gotten over? What is it, just, just sink into yourself for a second, quit thinking about other people. What is it you've never gotten over? Maybe you've had a failed marriage or more. And somehow that, or maybe you're failing in your marriage. May, what, is you, what is it you've never gotten over? What is it that as I talk, maybe you've had an abortion and it's hidden and nobody knows, but every time you try to think about getting close to God, it springs back up and strangles you and stops you from receiving forgiveness and grace in your start. What is it that even as, I, even as I bring this up, resentment starts to well up, regret starts to haunt you? What is it that's so bad you can't get unstuck and move forward? What is it that's causing you to get stuck in the past? What, are the, what is it that's causing regrets and resentment to fill your life and fill your soul? And here's a, no matter what it is, the book of Romans was written to liberate you, let the chains of past guilt fall off and set you free. Matter of fact, listen to this one verse in Romans and let your spirit soar. Check this out. The, Romans 8.1, there is no, what's the next word? There is no condemnation for those who are perfect. There is no condemnation for those who attend church. There is no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. And if you don't get anything else, get this. God does not want you walking around with a load of guilt. Get this. Jesus Christ was crucified so you could stop crucifying yourself. Everybody got that? Our greatest problem is sin and the liberating grace of God gets unleashed in the book of Romans, okay? Now, that's the first one. The second mega theme there, the second life-changing theme, big issue in life is this. What's our greatest challenge? And you know what it is? It's to change. Our greatest challenge is to go, man, now I'm forgiven. 
I'd like to change, but I can't change, okay? Would you raise your hand if you're going, man, there's just some stuff about me I wish I could get better at or be different. Okay, everybody except a couple people in the front. Um, <laughs> this is gonna be embarrassing. Uh, my wife's over there so she can attest to this after the service. Um, when we were newlyweds, you know, been married, I think about a year, and we were living in the Bay Area and um, living in Marin County, and we bought our first house, okay? And it was like 70 grand, some crazy thing like that. And, and it was like, to, to afford it, I was a poverty-stricken youth pastor, so to afford it, we, were like tw- we had to go 25 miles away from the church. And we, but we bought a, a new house, 1,000 square feet, tiniest thing you've ever seen, and, but it was, it was new. And the pro- has anybody ever bought a new house? Like new. Big mistake. <laughs> you walk in and you go like, where's the curtains? They don't exist yet. Nothing's there. I mean, it is like, so, the, and the problem is this, okay? Are any of you guys in here handy? Anybody like you're good with tools, fixing stuff? Anybody here? I know you are. You ran Mexicali, you gotta be. What? Okay, let me, hands up one more time. Sure, not you, not me. Good, I want you to see you at my house, you at my house. Oh, she, you're pointing at him. You're volunteering him. Good job. Um, my, I'm the polar opposite. I grew up playing sports. I don't know which end of the hammer to grab. I'm, you, I can break things. I can't fix them. The problem is this. I'm a newlywed guy, and I'm kind of hoping that Carol's like really impressed with this husband. And so I'm going to fake being competent and being handy so we're about to do some projects in this stupid new home we bought. So I go and I buy something that'll look really impressive. I buy a tool belt. <laughs> Who's got one? Oh yeah. So I buckle that suckle on. It was like, you know, the Wild West. They strapped on guns. Not anymore, man. You strap on a tool belt. I'm Tim the tool, you know. And then I get a, ha- you get a hammer, you know, right here. I'm ready for action. So it's a Friday night. We go, hey, let's put up some drapes. You know, we, we might want some privacy in this house. So living room here. And um, so we go to a fancy French drapery place called J.C. Penney, And <laughs> we, we buy some drapes. So we get home to put these drapes on. And I strap the tool thing on. I'm like, all right, got to get a ladder in there. And I'm going, hey, babe, you want to help? And so, so I'm, and as we're starting this, I'm thinking, I'll bet she's just like so impressed. Like, I, I marry this guy and he's even handy. This is like bonus stuff. And so, and I'm thinking I'm faking around. So, I, so we open the drapes, there's some instructions in there. Well, those are for guys that aren't competent. So throw those away because I'm a guy. And, and then we get these things up, you get the rod up. So you got to put the rod up, right? Okay, over the whole thing. So I drill holes, measure drill holes, get in the middle and the side. So we put this rod up where the drape's gonna come together. And I'm just, I put anchors in the whole thing. I mean, I got this thing wired. She is totally faked out. I, I'm assuming she's going, this guy is awesome. And, um, and, and then I'm just about the time, it's about like eight o'clock at night. I'm going, this is awesome. We hang the drapes up. And the second we hang the first set of drapes on the left-hand side, we look, we stand back and we go, oh no. Because the drapes are like about, eight inches off the floor. <laughs> and at, because I've hung the rod way too high. I'm going, these things should come with instructions. So now I'm kind of embarrassed. This is embarrassing to tell you all. I'm now, so now I'm embarrassed, all this kind of stuff. So we pull the thing out. Now I'm starting to lose my cool. Anybody here know what it's like to lose your cool? So now I'm starting to lose my cool. Okay, so we take these drapes and I'm just trying to speed up, all this kind of stuff. And I'm going, I can't believe it. So I take this and I'm just kind of now, I've moved from, from impressing my wife, the cat's out of the bag. She knows I'm not good at this kind of stuff. And so, and now I'm kind of ticked off. So I pull the stuff off and then I, you know, re- move them in eight inches, all that kind of stuff, get it on. Now it's like 10, 10 30 at night, hang the drapes up. Good, they're the right thing. I'm going, this is awesome. At least I resurrected this thing until we close them. And we close them, and they're about six inches apart. Because I have hung the stupid rod too far out, okay? And now I take the hammer, I throw it down, I go, I can't believe this, you know? And it's, now it's like 11 o'clock, and Carol just really sweetly says, you know what, honey, I think I'm going to let you wrap this up. Great job. I'm going to let you wrap it up. I'm going to bed. So, which translated in Greek means, I need to get away from this idiot. So, she goes to bed. 
Any of you wives know what I'm talking about? She goes to bed. So then, then I'm going, I pull the thing down, I measure the right thing, I get it all up. Finally, it's about like midnight, 12.30, I hang the thing up, good. Right length, right thing, it works. I stand back, I look at it. Our wall looks like Swiss cheese. There are holes all over the place. I'm gonna have to patch when I read a book on how to do that. And, and then I'm going to bed, and so I'm just frustrated. I'm going to bed, and I think, wait, I'm not, I'm not going straight to bed. I'm going to go to my study. So I go to my study. I get my Bible out, and I just say, I'm going to read my Bible and connect with God. This has not been the night I thought it was going to be. So I'm reading my Bible, and it's like God spoke to me. And God said, why are you so uptight? Here you are in your first ever home with your first wife, and, and only. Um, you're in your first home with your wife, newlyweds, your first ever project. You guys, this could have been like a memory. Well, it is. This could have been like a good memory. But because you, you lost your coal, you got so uptight, you just wrecked it. And let me ask you, before you climb all over me, do any of you have your own stories just like mine for yourself? And when I read this verse for the first time, I went, oh my gosh, they found me in the Bible. <laughs> Check this out. This is straight out of Romans. Paul says, I don't understand what I do. What I do isn't the good I want to do. No, the evil I don't want to do, I keep on doing that. The question is how uh, every one of us, if you're honest, you're sitting there going, I'd like to change. I'd like to be less, uh, less of an idiot. I'd like to be less whatever it is, and I'd like to be more that. Now, all of us have that, okay? The question is, what's the route to getting better so you have fewer regrets and make better decisions? What's the route? How does change happen? How does, by the way, how does change happen in your life? How does change happen in your emotions? How does God change a marriage? How does God change somebody and make a, and you know what it is? It's not all the stuff everybody thinks. You know what it is? Paul has a prescription that nobody ever sees. And here it is. It's to think better. It's to think, it all starts in your mind. Romans makes a big deal. What you think determines how you end up living. Check this out, rethink. God's supposed to rethink. Hey, look at this, Romans 8, 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature desires. Those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. Very next verse, the mind of the sinful man is death. The mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. Romans 12 says, you want to change? People, here it is. Be transformed by the renewing of your my, circle that whole verse. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is why, by the way, that is why I'm going to try to badger you, encourage you, challenge you to get to thrive this year for the whole thing or the evenings or whatever. Why? Because when you change your mind, that changes your life. How big a deal is this? No writers put it better than John Maxwell. This is going to go on the screen. This is brilliant. When you change your thinking, that changes your Okay, we're going to try that again. Y'all ready? Everybody here. When you change your thinking, that changes your? And when you change your beliefs, that changes your? Expect and now we're getting somewhere because when you change your expectations, that changes your? Attitude. And that's huge because when you change your attitude, that changes your? Behavior. And only when you change your behavior does it change your? Life, which means all life change starts when I change what I think. It all starts with thinking. When I change my thinking, that changes my beliefs and it all ripples down the entire way to changing my life. That is huge, okay? Our greatest challenge is change. Put yourself in settings where you will think amazing, great thoughts, okay? Now, the third mega theme in Roman, the third biggest issue in life is this, okay? What's our greatest calling? Because I gotta live for something. What's our greatest calling? And you know what it is? It's to live with purpose. Our greatest calling is to live with purpose. The Bible says this, you were created by God and made for a purpose. Funny thing is this, when, if somebody asks you, when were you born? Everybody can tell you. If you say, why were you born? It's a blank for most people. An alarm clock can tell you 
when to get up every morning, but an alarm clock cannot tell you why you should get out of bed. And the great tragedy is this. When somebody goes through life and they never know why they get up in the morning and question is this, how do you live a life of great impact? Because trust me, the state of California needs Christians to live lives of great impact. Would you agree? That our country needs that. Our world needs that. And so the question, how do I live a life of great impact? Whether I'm a teenager down in Mexico, well, you'll see a video of that in a minute, with all of this kind of stuff. And next to Jesus Christ, there was no human being ever on this planet that made the impact of the Apostle Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul established the first churches in the Roman Empire. There are over a billion Christians in the world today because of the influence of one guy who single-handedly took the gospel of Jesus Christ all across the Roman Empire. Question, what does it take to take the one life you get to live and make a major impact? What does it take, okay? You know what it takes? Here it is, God's direction on this in Romans, passion. It's passion. It's to get your fire back, get your dreams back, get your hopes back, get hear from God back, get a sense of calling back, know why you're here back, and then let that drive you and fill your life with passion. Romans 12, 11, this is awesome, says this. Never be lacking in zeal. Circle the words lacking in zeal. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. What's the next word? Serving the Lord. Okay, now, it was, look up here for a second. He says this, never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor. How do you get your passion back? Here it is, serving. How, you're going, keep your spirit. He's saying, get your passion back. How does that happen? Buy something new. No, you'll be passionate about it for about two days. He goes, when you serve, it lights you up. Somehow, it lights you up. Let me give you another great verse. This is awesome, okay? Don't be overcome. By the way, I'm gonna read this once and then we're all gonna read this. Every teenager, this should be on the wall of your room. Everybody in here, that everybody, especially where we live, this should be on everybody's house. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I'm gonna say that again. Just let me read it to you. Do not be overcome by evil. Move to Tennessee or Texas. Do not be overcome. You know, it doesn't say, I can't, I've been looking for that. I can't find it, okay? The, um, I understand why people would want to. I just can't find it. He says this, do not be overcome by evil, but what? Overcome evil with good. He's going, the Christian response is to live with God, to live transformed by God, to live fueled by God, and to live to make some great stuff happen. That's why he says this, do not be overcome by evil. That's playing great defense. He goes, but get on the offense. Overcome evil with good. We'll hear about this more. We have started going, what would it look like to live this verse? So we've started saying this. What would it look like to launch 100 churches, brand new churches, in the area they're most needed in 10 years? 90 of them in the state of California. And then 10 of them in other desolate locations, Fresno, you know, things like that. The, um, and we started dreaming, like, what would that look like? What would it look like, because people don't live well until they think well, what would it look like somehow with Mark coming, Thrive Worship exploding, all this kind of stuff, to influence a, th a million people a day, YouTube channels and all, the, all of the stuff they think? What would it look like? To, you basically, the Bible says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, here is why this is such a big deal. Y'all ready? Okay. Passion and purpose go together. Passion and purpose go together. If you show, show me somebody with no passion, with no purpose, I will show you somebody with no passion, which means then they gotta have affairs to get something going on in their life or they gotta buy something or they gotta do something because they're not living to make anything. Most people in our area, they have a home they live in, but no reason why they're in this area. And if you find somebody with a little bit of purpose, they will have a little bit of passion. You find somebody with a lot of purpose, they will have a lot of passion. That makes sense? And if you don't believe that, I got to experience this about a week and a half ago, okay? Some really great guys. Uh, Scott Shaw was there, um, Taro from McCooney. Anybody know McCooney? 
Tom from McConey, Phil Oates, one of the owners of Sacramento Kings, um, a whole bunch of guys. They said, hey, would you like to come? And they, they, we had lunch and they said, we'd love to take you on a trip. It's free. I went, sure. So we went to Scottsdale for a couple days, went to restaurants, played golf and just hung out, fellowship with eight guys. It was awesome, okay? And then, so we played two days of golf, nice hotel. And then, and then, and then we went and flew to Yuma, Arizona. Why did he fly to Yuma, Arizona? Because all these guys crossed the border and went to Mexicali with all of our kids. And look at this. Here is 600 kids, and teenagers and adults in Mexico. Isn't that awesome? Great job. If you were there, would you raise your hand? Whole bunch of you up there. Great job, okay? And that's them there. But the really fun thing is this. All these guys come down there, and they, we literally cross the border into Mexico. These guys are serving in the food lines. Check it out, okay? And that's a lineup of all these guys that were on this trip. They're serving in the food lines. And they serve dinner to over 600 kids. They get up at 6.30 the next morning, back to the food line. They, they slept in a tent with a bunch of other guys. It was amazing, okay? And then what happens is we take them out, okay? And there's Phil. Every village we went to, bam, he jumped into it right away with kids, okay? Then here's another one, Taro. Ta that's Taro from Makuni, serving with Angel at Angel's Tacos in Victoria, Mexico, okay? And Tar Taro's a really solid Christian. We put him on stage. He was awesome. It was great. Then what happens is this. There, there's Mark. The, you can tell there's a dad. Look how son, shocked his son is to see his dad up here. It was awesome. And you know what I discovered down there? What I discovered was this. These guys, in Me we were in nice hotel, went to the Kings game, owner's box because of Phil. All this amazing, really cool stuff to do, but nobody was as fired up on the golf course as they were in Mexico serving. Nobody was as fired up at a restaurant as they were at Angel's Tacos. Nobody was as fired up as where they were living to make, because ultimately the only people that are gonna have authentic passion are living to make great things things happen. And I have, I know people that if they ever got more excited about what their money could make happen than the next thing they were going to buy, the world would be a better place and they would have way more passion. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think anybody would applaud that here in Granite Bay. The, um, um, yeah, it's okay. Mark will yell at you next tomorrow. Um, the, um, and kind of what I want to say is this, um, I'm going to put a video on now, but I'm gonna give you a chance to register for Thrive so you can get challenged to use your life to make a difference, okay? So would you grab, you got two ways to do this, okay? Matter of fact, I'm gonna actually put a video on and create about a minute of silence in here so you can fill this out. So would you grab this card? Yeah, I'm gonna make sure everybody got the, you already grabbed it once, or if you wanna QR code this thing, you just go to the back of here. Back of here, you can register for Thrive right there. You can register for Thrive. If you're going, what is Thrive? It is a conference that we do this place will be far more packed than this. It is, it is May 5 and May 6. It's all day Thursday and Thursday night. So if you're going, I work, just come at night, okay? Um, and day two, and if you're going, what's gonna happen in there? If you, you can look on the inside of this thing, um, what's gonna happen is this. We have 70 seminars between everything. We do a lot of screwing around. We unleash worship bands. We unleash comedians. But we have, for the first time ever, we're theming sessions based on everybody's six biggest needs. So we're leading off with this session. Tar Bob Goff and Carlos Whitaker, we're just gonna unleash those guys and go, everybody here is depressed, turn depressed people into dreamers. They got to dream again and hear from God for vision, okay? That's, that's how the whole conference opens. That afternoon, Kerry Newhoff, who's the leading expert on this, is going to do 10 trends disrupting your life. And matter of fact, his podcast is a million people listening to it. Everybody listens to this guy. Business people, pastors, everybody. The, uh, we're going to unpack 10 trends disrupting your life, your school, your state, our world, and how to counteract the effect on that on you and your family. Do not miss that. Nobody should miss that one. Then that evening, Christians are going to... Christians are divided and they're meaner than ever. That we're gonna we're gonna basically go. Uh, Rick Warren, Michael Metcalf, Hosanna Wong are gonna basically speak on how do you learn to love people again? Shouldn't we get back? Shouldn't we start following the guy that prayed we'd be one? Then, because most of us need to laugh, we're gonna unleash Andrew Stanley that night and we bring it in a comedian. Then the next day, day two on the Friday, okay, we're gonna do a thing on leadership. And those of you that are, if you're in high school, just get there. Um, the uh, parents, grandparents, anybody wanting to influence anything should get to this thing. 
and it's gonna be four people on leadership speaking for 20 minutes each. The first is Mark Clark. Our chapel, our staff chapel, Mark spoke at it about two months ago on leadership and how do you make disciples? How do you influence people to grow spiritually? 20 minutes into this thing, I was like, this is so good. We just gotta unleash him to do that at Thrive. It was some of the best. I'm sitting here listening to Mark going, this is amazing, and this is stuff I do. I want everybody's got to hear this. So, so we're going to go back to back to back to back. It's Mark Clark. It's 20 minutes with Taro, 20 minutes with me. And then Patrick Lencioni, if you're in business, he has, he's one of the leading voices to business in the world. He has come out with a thing um, called the Workplace Genius, and he will give you a test on six genius styles. You have two of them, how to discover what you two are and how to implement those, how to counteract the ones you don't have. So it's the whole thing is on lead again. And by the way, that's gonna be a fun session because every one of those speakers gets 20 minutes exactly and we're going to do it just like they do at the Oscars. If somebody goes too long, we just start playing a song and they're off the stage, okay? Then that afternoon, get healthy again. Kevin Thompson, it's gonna be an entire thing on spiritual health, emotional health, how do you get healthy in our culture, family health, and then that night we're going to just unleash Mark Clark and go, all right, buddy, go for it, help everybody, just yell at everybody and tell them to get, get their hopes back up. All of that, by the way, and there's 70 seminars, it's a collision of, there are 2,000 people from around the country and there'll be a couple thousand from here, okay? And I want to invite you right now to register for this in one of two ways. You can use the QR code on the back of this or I'm actually hoping you will all do this, okay? You can just fill out this card. While you're sitting there, there are pens under every chair. During this video, fill this card out. And what you do is, matter of fact, grab your pen, now you can start. Put your name in, your email, phone number, and address. Um, then, conference tickets. Students are only $25. And high school students, I just want to say something to you and your parents who are in here. My advice as a pastor and a parent would be this. Cut school in Jesus' name, replay Mexicali, and get to thrive, okay? Um, why, now, why is that a big deal? What happens in here for two days will beat anything that will happen to you in a California classroom for that two days. Trust me. Okay. My, my own kids, I pull them out of school every year to come to Thrive. They still went to college and none of them are on parole. So that'd be my recommendation. Then if you're going below there, so if you're a student, fill that out. Then if you're an adult, you can buy that. Or it's the smart thing to do is this. You buy one, you get one free. So as many people as you want to bring, you buy those. It's $99 and you get a free ticket with that. And then here's what's going on. Look up here for a second. I get real serious. Around the world right now, pastors have just gotten beaten up. I mean, assaulted, anybody leading anything has gotten beaten up. We're going to scholarship everybody we can in. We, overseas, we're paying for some people to come. We need a wave of generosity here. to Thrive doesn't make money, it loses money. We just want to lose less money. And so if you fill this card out, all you got to do is circle one, okay? Circle 100, 200, 500, 1,000, or 5,000. Here's an example of a card filled out. Kurt filled his card out. Two students, four adults, four buy one, get one free, and then Kurt circled $5,000. He doesn't know this yet. Thank you, Kurt. I know you're watching. And, the, um, and then, so if you fill this out, and then we'll tell you what to do with it after you're done filling out. So grab a pen and fill this thing out. You could help, you could help, you could be, you could help yourself, but you can actually help a whole lot of people. So, and to do that, teenagers are gonna love this. Um, we're gonna show you a video of just stuff that's happened around here in the last two weeks. Check this out. Isn't that cool? All right, to wrap this up, um, to wrap this up, our greatest problem, sin, our greatest challenge, change. Romans, our greatest calling is to live with purpose. That'll give you passion. And our greatest fear is this, it's rejection. Our greatest fear of everybody in here is rejection. 
That's why Romans 8 puts it this way. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? There it is right there. Separated from God, separated from people. The shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. And what is God's reassurance? This is awesome. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that awesome? Or Paul puts it this way in verse 31, what then shall we say to these things in response? If God is for us, who can be against us? Okay, and just look up here, I'm gonna close with this. I did a memorial service for an amazing lady named Kathy Lewis, um, Sally Shaw's mom, and uh, in Marin County, uh, she and her husband, I think have been married 60 years. Uh, still married, they had a major influence in our life. We had young kids who were living in Marin County. I was a youth pastor there. This incredible person, tons of friends, and we have a memorial service in Marin County. Church overlooks the Golden Gate Bridge. It was stunning. And I am I'm at this memorial service, and I'm gonna wrap it up. And I'm looking at all these brokenhearted people, and I'm looking at her husband of 60 years. He's got tears in his eyes on the front row. What do you say? And so here's what I said to them, and no matter what you're going through, here's what I want to say to you. Jesus put it this way, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And they said, do you believe that? Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And last week was Easter. And you know what you learned on Easter? Something happened on Easter and bam, the disciples were zapped and they were never the same. And you know what's interesting? It wasn't just that the disciples discovered that Jesus was alive. You know what the disciples discovered? The Jesus that resurrected and came back alive, he said, because you believe in me, that's gonna happen to you too. In other words, Jesus was saying to these disciples, guess what? No matter what you're going through, if you know me, you get a resurrection. And you get a resurrection. And you get a resurrection. Remember that old Oprah thing she did where she gave away cars? You get a car. You get a car. You get a car. You, I wish I was there. You get a car. Everybody got a car. Jesus is saying, if you know me, you get a resurrection. You get a resurrection. You get a resurrection. You, in other words, he is saying that, which, by the way, that changes everything. But if you, because if you take that seriously, death has no power to separate you from God because you get a resurrection. Okay? If you feel guilty and you're walking in here going, man, you have no idea. What, guilt has no power to keep you separated from God. Why? Because you get a resurrection. If you're here and you've gotten really bad tragic news or you've gotten really bad health news about yourself or whatever it is, I got good news for you. No matter how bad that news is, you don't have to live in fear anymore because you get a resurrection. And I looked at this husband with tears in his eyes in the front row and I looked at all of her friends and I said this to everyone. I said to every brokenhearted relative here, to every brokenhearted friend here, because you are a follower of Jesus Christ, I want to say to you, the next time you see her, you will be more alive than you have ever been. More alive than you ever Because the gospel makes clear one thing. You have a resurrection coming, and that lasts forever. All God's people said, amen. Amen. 